Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and this is dedicated to all those spirits out there who believe life is meant to be magical and fun. Here we venture to share the very mysteries of self and reality. My purpose is to help light that spark inside of you, to reawaken your sense of fascination and awe towards the world. I'm going to try to help you hack reality and unleash your potential and open unlimited possibilities of wealth, health, and relationships in your life. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the love revolution in the reality revolution. We're going to talk about everything that's related to reality creation and finding love in your life and having that great relationship that you always wanted. You know, I've been studying reality creation for a very long time. Law of attraction and reality transurfing and all kinds of different consciousness studies. But one thing that I didn't really study as much and through some recent research, you know, is the idea of falling in love through reality creation, finding your soulmate, finding your twin flame. It's a very popular topic in the law of attraction community. Any group that I'm a member of right now, baby elephant, all of these, when you, when you go on, most people are trying to manifest the SP. They say the SP and that is their lingo for specific person. And there is a whole group of videos on YouTube that are talking about manifesting the specific person, different ways of manifesting love and understanding love. And so there's so many different aspects of, of this. This is so complicated, obviously. There's a million books that have been written about this. And there's a, a, a trillion love stories that you can read in romance novels because love is one of the most complicated and fascinating subjects. As a part of humankind, it is a wonderful and powerful thing. It is my belief that when we see the planets move, the very gravity that's moving, people don't understand why gravity works. It's because love. The movement of every celestial object is the movement of love. Love is what runs the universe. It is an energy, a very powerful and wonderful and perfect energy. So when did you first fall in love? And how did you feel in your body when you fell in love? That first time that you had your first kiss. Where were you when you had that first kiss, when you had those butterflies in your stomach, or you really wanted somebody and they didn't want you? When was the first time that happened? Or when you, when you don't want somebody and they, and they really want you? It's one of those things. It's such a complicated subject, but the really interesting aspect of it, as I've talked about, the reality revolution is a real thing. Right now we're experiencing a, an awakening, a shift in the way we actually live in this world. We're starting to understand the true power of quantum physics and the way that our minds interact with particles around us on a regular basis. And we're starting to see the power of our own minds to create reality. And we're seeing advancements in technologies that make time faster and faster and shorter. And the ability of our decisions have much more wider scale. And by going out and sampling larger and larger statistical samples, our own consciousness is able to create better and more wonderful and perfect and fantastic lives in every way, shape, and form. We are going through a singularity. This is going to be so wonderful. Everybody is going to be so prosperous. Information will be just sheer information will be able to be used to create matter. We're going to see AIs. We're going to see incredible things that are all good. People try to look at the future as this doom and it's not, it's not, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be powerful. And real, we see a reality revolution where more and more people are starting to realize how the, their, the power of their attention and focus, the use of their minds in a certain way can manifest realities around them. Of course it takes action and all kinds of different things, but right now, the really interesting aspect of law of attraction and reality creation, reality transurfing is how do you fall in love with somebody? What is the best way to fall in love? Can you fall in love and find a soulmate? Is there a soulmate? Is there only one of them out there or is there many soulmates? But how does it work and how can I attract my soulmate to me? And oftentimes as a coach, it's the, it's the number one reason when somebody comes to you and they say, I really want this specific person. It's almost like they would do a magic spell. And the thing is, I'm ashamed to admit 
when a long time ago, when I was in high school and there was a girl that I really, or maybe it was in, just in, a freshman in college, and there's a girl I really, really wanted in, 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 in the town that we were at, they, there, was a, there was a store that they, they sold magic spells. And, I, and they had a love spell that I could pay for 10 bucks. And I went and got a love spell done. Of course, nothing happened. The love spell didn't work. But the idea that there's magic out there that can create love. And how does love work? And what is the best way? We are powerful in so many ways. We create our own realities by our sheer observation. The way we collapse waves around us is an amazing and wonderful thing. But there's also a responsibility with this power. In my beef, you can definitely manifest and use these tools and techniques to manifest a specific person in your life. If there's somebody you really want, you may end up losing a lot in the process. And just by getting together with them does not mean that you manifested love. And a lot of times you'll manifest a specific person and it turns out they weren't who you wanted in the first place. But you did the manifesting. So you've literally manipulated a person into your life. And you have to take responsibility for that. So you have to understand your power. And then there'll be a point in time where your own soul will feel guilty if you have any relationship, if you create reality. So what I'm calling for and what I'm saying is that you can create somebody like that specific person. Oftentimes, it's better if you have a specific person that you really like. Don't go for that specific person. You want to go for the general idea of somebody similar. But it's much more complicated than that. And there's so much more to it. As the Buddha says, you yourself as much as anybody in the entire universe deserve your love and affection. And let's face it, falling in love is an amazing feeling. The biological and psychological and emotional and spiritual powers of love make you feel like, like you're getting caught in the pole of an exhilarating wave where you can think of nothing but being with your beloved, of intertwining in body and soul again and again and again. What could possibly be better? What are you thinking as you fall into, into your beloved's arms? But right now, it's never been a better time to be single and it's okay to be single. You don't have to have a relationship. Nowadays, you can choose when you wanna have a relationship the proliferation of dating apps on the internet, all of them, Match.com, there's so many different ones. So if you go on there, if you start just with Tinder and put your picture up, you'll start to get responses no matter what shape you're in, no matter where you're at. Literally, you have such a gigantic pool. You can be so specific in the way that you do this. And there, each dating website is different and you can find different kind of people at different sites if you go to christianmingle.com that might be better there's so many different ones and it's very interesting to explore the story i can tell you is when i was in uh, deeply into my business and please don't laugh or make fun of me because it's true when i was deeply into my business and I, I didn't have the time i wanted to date but i didn't have the time to go through those dating websites and talk to people and didn't I, I really only wanted to meet them in person but i didn't want to get the process and then i read um, on tim ferris one of, on his blog about virtual dating he talks about virtual assistants quite a bit so the idea is there's a company that offers virtual dating services so they take over the responsibility of all your dating they, they put you on all the websites every single one and they go and they initiate um, conversations with different girls and they, they hire comedy writers to start with a conversation they, they'll approve through you whatever they're going to say first uh, but so then you start thinking is there people out there that are doing it on the other end so is there a virtual dating assistant talking to a virtual dating assistant but the bottom line is I knew what I, what they had said. And so when I met with them, then I, you know, I could still act like I had said that. And then it didn't feel genuine. And, and all the times I went on those dates, it never worked out. But they gave me an idea. I could see the way that they did it. And it's not difficult. And you just have to focus on it. If you want to find the love of your life, just put a little bit of time into it. Put, your, put yourself out there. Give yourself an opportunity. Be, be specific about what you want. But there's so many things that you need to know. The pickup 
artist industry, particularly on the male end, is it seems like a billion dollar industry. Therapists and mentors and relationship coaches all around, coaching men how to date, how to find dates, how to pick up girls. And so women should be aware of these techniques and they, or they aren't. That's what I notice. One of the things that you should read is The Game by Neil Strauss. He um, it basically kind of goes undercover and lives with a group of pickup artists in Beverly Hills. And they all live in this mansion together. So, and it's pretty interesting. And it's a very good book. But basically, these, these guys would go out and they would, they would experiment with every type of pickup line. And they would work together. They called it surging. So if two people went out together, they would have a script that each of them would use. And they, they experimented with all kinds of hypnotic induction techniques and stories. They would bounce back and forth. They play through the psychological profiles of their competitors, um, having different scripts. If there's an alpha in the room or if the girl's with a boyfriend, they had specific stri- scripts. And they got better and better and better at it. And it became science. And so a lot of times when you go out, you see these people that are using these scripts and it just takes away from the joy of falling in love. Because don't you remember that time when we could spontaneously fall in love? Those times when we could go to a bar or go to an event or the grocery store and we could meet somebody that you didn't meet online and you just said, hello, my name is and whatever. And then you just introduce yourself and start talking. We have become so locked into our world, our, our digital worlds, that well, sometimes we lose touch with the outside world, and, and maybe our soulmate is right there. Finding your soulmate can be coached, and I'll talk more and more about it. But if you look into this more, there's so much more to it to understand. Relationships, you, you, we, de- we deeply need to understand women and men. And the key thing that I have learned and the way that cre- reality is created using these reality creation models and quantum physics is that our brains are controlling a little bit of the way our attention works, especially in relationships. Think of your brain not as your brain, but at a million or two million year old brain that's evolved over time and it's gotten better and better and it's become this thing that over a very long period of time, it carries signals and new peptides and different neurological signals and chemicals and markers that are inside the brain that create neural patterns inside the brain and they're locked in those neural patterns a lot of times we're born with them because of the way our brains are put together so sometimes this can define the way we act and we don't we don't aren't aware of it once we become aware of it it's another script that we can break but is something to be aware of so The idea is your soulmate is out there. And if you keep your eyes open and are aware, now is the best time ever to fall in love and to find love. And more people are falling in love than ever before because it's out there and it's possible. The biggest thing I see personally is a fatal flaw. And that is the, there's a lot of people because they have so much choice, particularly some beautiful girl out there, right? who has so many different choices, like 30 or 40 choices, that they never trust the person that they're with because they always think something better is going to be around the corner. Is it? Sometimes falling in love is not about the person that you're with, it's about the person that you are yourself. And that we could literally at some point of consciousness be in love with anybody because we are in love with everybody. Love is universal. So understanding how love works is goes beyond just that concept of love. 67% of marriages fail. 67%. So that means two thirds of every marriage is going to fail. Why are they failing? You know, in that moment of love, you're not likely to be aware that this high is fleeting. And the intensity of your feelings is going to wane. And this will probably be a good thing. The truth is that every relationship invariably reaches a point of predictability. And you feel numb from day to day life and the natural conflicts and resentments that can build up over time. You're desperate for a little variety. But the biggest mistake is resigning yourself to the idea that this burnout is love's inevitable conclusion. When in reality, there is a relationship waiting for you that far exceeds the excitement and novelty of the honeymoon phase, the energy in the human body and its purest potential 
has been calculated by physicists to be 10 times greater than the energy in a typical hydrogen bomb. This was calculated with Einstein's famous E equals MC squared using the mass of an average human body, 155 pounds or 70 kilograms. If you're willing to claim and use your energy and apply it to this world, there is nothing but pure potential. The idea is that we come from a hunter-gatherer type of situation. And women had a different role early on as our brains developed. They had to gather. So they had to gather the berries and they had to know when the plants would come up at the right times. And so they needed to be aware of all the different places at the same time. And when they would speak with other women, they would have what they call meadow reports where they would share information and they would talk and they'd say, well, the berries are over here and this is what happened. And so that they would share a lot of information, but the hunter would go and have an objective and he would be out and he would bring something home. And so when women start to share their meadow report, Similar to how they talk to the woman. They talk to the man. The man doesn't understand. He doesn't understand because she wants to give him a meta report. And so then she feels like she's being violated because she is not, uh, with the way that she's giving the meta report, she's not seeing that he's responding and he doesn't respond. So it's an understanding of the way the brain works and understanding how women and men communicate. But part of a good relationship is this loss of sharing. And once we don't share, it leads to a loss of trust. Men filter out content and share the objective of the hunt. When two men share too many details, they lose trust with each other. In order to gain trust, your partner expects certain things in your communication. You have to overcome negative slides that you create about yourself. I meet a lot of people that easily could be in love, but they have a self-image of themselves and that they believe that they're too ugly or overweight or whatever it is. They always create an excuse and I call it a slide. And these slides affect the realities that we move towards. An interesting story is Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, the famous French painter. He broke both legs in childhood and was physically handicapped his entire life. And while growing up, Lautrec, he was deeply depressed because he realized how ugly he was. And as the years passed, his deformity became even more evident, causing him to suffer deeply. And then there came this point at which he, his distress reached its peak and he was forced to accept the inevitable. And he finally overcame the limitations of his deformity and threw himself into life. And as soon as he let go of the importance of his condition, the slide ceased to exist and good fortune came his way. Aside from realizing his talent as a painter, he was also extremely popular with women. Lautrec was one of the founders of the famous Moulin Rouge Cabaret in Paris. And he was loved by many women and not only for his paintings. So this idea that you can't be loved is ridiculous. There's, there's a path and a lifeline for you where the, your, your beauty shines. And can't we all just agree? You've met somebody that was not particularly attractive to you. And then after a little while, they become attractive. Everybody becomes beautiful once you get to know them in a certain way. Whatever ugliness they have goes away. It's almost like our minds reshift their face. And I know we've all experienced this. Once you get to know somebody, they start to look different because our minds begin to create in our own interface a more beautiful person that we see and on and broody is in the eye of the beholder i can tell you though there is that thing you need to find a way to find your inner confidence in my case when i was growing up in in high school i had a huge gigantic underbite where i could put three fingers in front of my front teeth to the to the the teeth when i and it was just very embarrassing and I had tried to have braces forever, but it was just, you know, there was nothing I could do. The only thing they could do is break my jaw and take some of the bone out and, and break the top of my jaw and reshape my whole face. And it was expensive and complicated. And I had to get braces for like six years to maneuver my teeth so that they were straight before the surgery. So my teeth got worse before they got better. And then when they did the surgery, they broke my top of my jaw and then they broke the bottom of my jaw and they put bone from my hip around the top of the jaw and filled in the bone and then wired my jaw shut for several months while it healed. And I could not smile before that. So when somebody saw a picture of me before that time, you would never see me smile and I would hold my mouth together because if you saw my underbite, I would be very embarrassed. 
But once I woke up and I let my face heal and I got better and I could smile again, and I realized the power of my smile, I was able to be loved when I couldn't be loved before because I didn't think I deserved it because of my underbite. And I could have easily loved now that I realize it. I could have found love in many ways, even with my underbite. But I didn't realize that because you create the faultiness of yourself when you start to create these images or slides or beliefs about yourself. So you must find love in yourself. And the number one thing that you can do to find love is to find love for yourself. I can tell you that was my greatest realization. Once I began to truly love myself, it was easy to find love because it's easy to love something that loves itself. If you don't love yourself, nobody will want to love you. So the first thing, wherever you're at and whatever you're doing, it's okay. In fact, it's critical for you right now to find love for yourself, no matter what your flaw, find love for yourself. You can do this. Of course, you can study the idea of falling in love. And you may have a role model that can serve as an example, like a demonstration copy, but not as a yardstick or template to be emulated. Your yardstick for finding love is your soul. Simply allow it to explore all its qualities within your current sector. It is better to put a photograph of yourself up on a wall and admire that than someone else's image. Loving yourself is extremely beneficial and constructive. Loving yourself leads to self-approval, is only punishable by balanced forces, if accompanied by disregard for others. You really are a unique individual, and in this sense, no one can compete with you. Just give yourself permission to be yourself. There can be no competitors to personal uniqueness. Remember that you have a right to your own individuality and you will have a huge advantage over those who try to copy the experience of others. You will not get anywhere by striving to become like him or her. Become yourself. Allow yourself this luxury. However long it takes, while you wear the mask of an existing star, at most you will be a copy and at worst a parody. Now stars don't, do not become stars by copying other people. When you give up on futile attempts to be like someone else, everything will work out. Likewise, when you cease futile attempts to repeat other people's scripts, everything will work out. When you acknowledge the brilliance of your own individuality, other people will have no option but to agree with you. Allow yourself to be presumptuous enough to have. All great actors play themselves. This might seem strange because the roles they play differ, but personality, character, and charm Give an actor away immediately. The hardest role to play is the one where you play yourself and allow yourself to remove the mask and be yourself. It is much easier to play someone else because putting on a mask is comparatively easy and the actor will have the professional skills to pull the role off. It is infinitely more difficult to remove the mask, but if you can take off the mask, what ensues is not role play, but what they call life on the stage. It only seems difficult, but in fact, deciding to have is quite straightforward. All it requires for you to shake off the stereotypes imposed by pendulums about love. And once and for all, claim belief in the infinite possibilities of your own soul. No matter where you're at, no matter what your situation, however ugly you think you are or not deserving of love, you deserve love. There is nothing any pendulum can do to stop you. If you reject the experience of others and give yourself permission to be a star, all they can do is imbue you with oppressive thoughts like a star has to be beautiful and I'm not beautiful. A star has to be able to sing well and dance, but I cannot. A star has to have talent, which I do not have. I have not got what it takes. I'm better of watching how other people do it. That is not the script that you're following when you follow yourself. True love, 
pure, the true love, when you've been deepest in love, that satisfaction is beyond compare. True love is yours for the taking. Remember, in, when you're in true love, everything starts with you. True love is a state you must move into within yourself first. And once you do, you don't need your partner do, to do anything, change anything, or show up in a different way. You are creating your own reality. You are not depending on others for love. He or she doesn't even need to know you're reading or listening to this or buy into its concepts. Because when you change, your partner changes. When you harness the power of your body's energy and consciously use it to create true love, you get everything you're looking for in your relationships. By understanding and harnessing the power of your own energy, you can unlock and encounter a more evolved version of yourself. It's a self who can handle every obstacle with strength and grace, who lives authentically and freely, and who loves unconditionally and passionately. But first, you have to go back to the beginning and look at how you've loved in the past. And what is your love story? A lot of times, when you look at your love story, your love story is how you learned about love from your parents. Did they kiss in front of you? Because sometimes parents don't do that. Did they let you watch other people kissing on TV? Because that can change your understanding of love. There's so many different ways to love and understand it. So if you want a specific person, then you can do it. You have to create a very visual movie-like setting with multiple events, with strong feelings that you are with this person. You can imagine cuddling with them or eating dinner with them. You can set a plate out at, at the dinner table, even if they're not there. You can imagine just doing regular things like driving in the car together. As you continue to do this, they will show up in some way, shape or form. Remember, if you do this, it does not mean that they are yours forever. You simply have the opportunity to meet. But true love always shines through in the end. So if you're doing this, take responsibility for it. And maybe it is your true soulmate. But you truly find your true soulmate when you're more open to the possibilities. Because I believe maybe 5% could be your soulmate. I mean, I, there's a lot of soulmates out there. Don't get into the idea there's only one. There is a lot of different ones. That is my belief. But the idea is you have to be open. And then once you fall in love, you have to stay in love. And there's some different things that we learn from that. Number one, there's six human needs. There's six human needs that you need for love. It comes from uh, being a child and everything. First of all, you need certainty. For a woman or man, they need to be certain about the love. Number two is variety. It can't be the same thing over and over and over. Number three is they need to feel significant. They need to feel important and significant. Number four is love and connection. That you're connected to each other. And number five is growth. And number six is contribution. Rejection breeds obsession. Oftentimes, the source of the problem is the, is the blueprint. So you have a blueprint that you've created about love, going back to your beliefs of it. And that oftentimes is the source of your problem. You may dislike men or women. You may believe and have certain beliefs about men or women based on your family or some experience that you had, which may be completely wrong. And you may be ascribing stereotypes that destroy your ability to be in truly wonderful relationships. You can do this. You must focus on yourself. And if you want to be in your, in your in that relationship or you're starting one, don't get into a habit of withholding. Don't withhold your love. Don't withhold as punishment. Once you start to do that, that usually ends up being the end of the relationship. 
understand a lot of times there's a battle for attention in a relationship. And so somebody may realize that they can get attention by acting like they're sick because men in general will go and take care of somebody that's sick. It's, it's our responsibility. But if somebody is playing like they're sick, then what happens is we don't trust that person. And even though they get attention, they don't get a good attention. The proper kind of attention. We learn this as children. We learn to request love and attention when we get hurt. And so that we get hurt to get love and attention because we just want that love and attention. You understand that we are still men and women and we have our own ideas and different ways that we integrate in relationships. It's just like the story of the frog and the scorpion. The scorpion comes up to the shore and wants to cross the river and says, frog, carry me across to see my family on the other side. And the frog said, well, I can't let you do that because you'll, you'll, you'll poison me on the way. And the scorpion said, that's ridiculous. I would never do that. I need to get to the other side. That's ridiculous. And so they, the, the frog takes the scorpion and as they're jumping across, the scorpion bites him. And the frog begins to die and says, I can't believe you did this. You're killing yourself. Why'd you do it? And the scorpion said, because I'm a scorpion and I sting frogs. And that's just like what we're talking about. People have their own belief system and identity that they create and that they will let that override what their decisions are. And so we think because we're adults, it's different. As adults, we still get hurt and it's equally important that we get attention and love when we need it. And if you're not willing to give love and attention, you shouldn't be in that relationship. The problem comes when you get addicted to attention through pain. And that usually ends up messing up the relationship. In our culture, when somebody is hurt, it's our obligation to help them. Some people realize if they're always hurt, always in trouble, always in an emergency, they can get attention around the clock. And the problem is that it's a very low quality attention, not the attention of a passionate lover that is driven to be with you. Understand your attention and how you're placing your attention. If you haven't found the love you want, then, then place your attention not on the lack of love, but on the love, on what love is and being in love with yourself and the surroundings and you will draw love to you. But attention is important. And if you're with a woman or if a man is whatever relationship in, in whatever kind of variety, usually a woman wants attention all the time. Understand men, men don't have the attention to give oftentimes and this interplay causes problems in relationships. Women treat men like they're hairy women. Women process, the amazing thing is men, women process information in both hemispheres of the brain and men usually only process in one hemisphere. So women are getting more information, it's being processed better. But then they communicate their information in these meadow reports. So understand attention styles and the way that attention is affecting you. Hunters hunt and that's all they can do. Gatherers have to walk around and figure out where everything is at the right time. Women, in most cases, statistically, through science, are not as strong physically as men. And so this can dominate the way the relationship is. The interesting thing that I read is that out of a, in, a, in a group of 100 people that Tony Robbins had in one of his conference, 95% of the women had felt um, unsafe when they were out and about in public. And only 4% of the men. So women are in a, in a state of fear um, by um, uh, not feeling safe. And women need safety. And they sometimes will come to a man for safety. We are sometimes doing what we're genetically programmed to do. But if you're in a relationship and all you're going to do is criticize, if you're coming from that place, it'll never work. To become entangled, it's just like in quantum physics with two particles becoming entangled. I believe the entanglement occurs when you inspire trust. And trust is inspired when someone has their best interest at heart and their interests are aligned. It's important to appreciate your partner's language. If you don't have much to say, at least say it with a warm gesture, like a smile or hug. And as a hunter, don't come home empty-handed. Every once in a while, once a week, bring a small gift. Align with the effort your partner is making.
But understand that women have been preyed upon. They're stronger emotionally. They can tolerate more pain. But women genetically are looking to be protected. And understand that is part of what's going on if you're finding your soulmate. That still, your soulmate is going to be genetically programmed in those ways. It really has nothing to do with logic. It is two million years of conditioning. 95% of women are concerned for their safety in any given month. But I believe anybody can heal their romance, no matter how bad you think it is. Love can rule the day, no matter what the situation is. If you act as if you're already in love. One thing I recommend you try every once in a while. Three minutes of soul gazing. Just look into each other's eyes for three minutes. It's very powerful. And there's images that cross. But men get stuck in certain habits, rituals, or behaviors. And also men get stuck in certain emotions and it's hard for them to change emotions. But women can change their emotions quickly because they're stronger emotionally. I believe all men want to just simply take care of women. That's what they want to do. And they want to take care of an authentic woman. So using tears to manipulate is not authentic. If a man feels that a woman is using her pain to manipulate him, he loses his trust and becomes suspicious. And I'm saying this because this is when I go deep into these relationship books, that is a common theme is understanding these differences. You know, women are from men are from Mars. Women are from, women are, women are from Venus. We've been talking about this forever. And, and these are obvious things. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable to talk about these differences. And sometimes these, these differences are wrong. Everybody's different, but there is a pattern and it's an interesting pattern. It's a pendulum that's sucking us in. Our, our genders are our pendulums oftentimes and understanding them gives us greater power over our own situation and alignment. So if I'm, you know, so men, they need to learn to be present. I think that's the key. Women know when a man is not being present. Now, the thing that we have to talk about, if we're going to talk about love is the idea of the love is pain. If you're going to love, you're going to hurt. And you're going to suffer grief. And I've met people that are so afraid of grieving, that they won't fall in love. They've suffered a great loss or something terrible has happened. And because of that, they can never overcome it to find love again. Don't let that scare you away from finding love because we will not feel those, that grief if we just simply live by living, we find we'll find grief in our lives. If you love, you're going to love, you're going to hurt. Relationships are deepened by pain. Oftentimes like a muscle, a scab that holds over and you end up being stronger because of the pain. It's a spiritual lesson. Love is powerful. What happens a lot of times people get into habits and rituals where they, they, kind of hurt each other in certain ways by the words they use. Don't do that. No matter what, no matter what anger you're feeling, whatever wounds that you have, heal them and create passion in your life. You can't be harsh or critical with yourself. These wounds will heal through love and acceptance and is worth it. You need to find that inner radiance, that glow of authenticity and finding in the authenticity that we've talked about, that's what creates the radiance. If you express your feelings, it will change. The only thing that will stop a relationship with a man, if you close up to them, men want a woman to open to them. If you open to him, he'll die for you. He wants you to open to him. People get into a relationship to feel emotion. That's why, to magnify our own human emotion. Our deepest fear sometimes is not that we are inadequate. It is that we are powerful beyond measure. And light can scare us, especially when it comes to relationships. 
You can't be in a codependent relationship. They always create an excess potential by the very codependency of it. Do not idealize and overestimate the person that you're with because it will always end in delusion, disillusionment. To experience reciprocal love, you must let go of the right to possess somebody like they're an object. You always have to pay for expressions of contempt and vanity. If you do that in a relationship, they will always come back to you. No matter what you've been taught, you must let go of the need to assert your superiority over anybody. Because any good relationship, it will not work. I don't care what you think. Don't try to hide your shortcomings. Because it will create the opposite effect. Whatever you hide, it becomes more obvious. Your positive qualities compensate for any inadequacies. The greater the importance of your goal, the less likely you are to achieve it. So, whoever, whatever kind of love that you want in your relationship or to find somebody, don't make it important. When we start to make the people that we want important or the relationships we want important, then that's what works against us. You will be less likely to achieve it. Desires are realized when they are free of excess potential created by projected importance and dependency. So let go of feelings of guilt and the need to justify your actions once you follow that path. If you're being authentic, there's no reason to be guilty. Let go of the guilt. It is enough to give yourself permission to be yourself. No one has the right to judge you. You have the right to be yourself. While you too may be tempted to write off love at first sight, I believe now to trust your intuition to find love. And love at first sight is not unrealistic. People think that it's, not, it's ridiculous that you really need to meet somebody. But don't be too hasty. Your brain is hardwired to say yes or no at high speeds. It's what we were built for, making cuts faster than the rose ceremony on The Bachelor. In fact, your brain sizes up a potential mate within th the first three minutes of meeting. That's right, three minutes. It's an intuitive skill developed millions of years ago to distinguish friend from foe, mate from mistake. So look, let's break down the chemistry of all this important first three minutes. At any government, your brain is taking, at any given moment, your brain is taking in 400 billion bits of information. However, of those 400 billion bits, you are consciously processing only 2,000 bits. So no matter how many mindfulness meditations or therapy sessions you might have attended, you will not be conscious of most of the information that you're taking into your brain. It's a good thing to, for the sheer volume of information would completely overload you. But just because you are not aware of them doesn't mean that those unconscious pieces of information don't have an impact. They are being processed and synthesized to create your preferences, and your romantic and sexual preferences are no exception. Your brain has constructed a template of everything it desires most out of your relationships. A well-known researcher named John Money dubbed this template the love map. It is totally subconscious breakdown of everything that turns us on neurologically and emotionally. So love maps vary in nature from one person to another. Love map might determine that that only waifish short-haired brunettes do the trick, or while another might prefer buxom redheads. Your love map locks in your physical and even emotional type, as well as your as more atypical sexual needs, behaviors, fetishes, and all of that by the age of seven. That's right, by the first grade, your brain had already cemented the bulk of your sexual preferences. So, sometimes they say that the person you fall in love with is like your first crush or your first your kindergarten teacher. Your brain has essentially written up a casting spell for your ideal lover, and it turns out the first audition is less than, the, than one second long. The seemingly intangible sexual chemistry between two people actually has a biological source called pheromones. In 2008, researchers discovered an almost imperceptible tiny olfactory nerve called the nerve zero that they believe is the route through which pheromones are processed. The fibers of this nerve start in the nose, but completely bypass the olfactory cortex, the part of the brain that processes smell, and goes straight to the sexual centers of the brain. So even though you're not conscious of a smell, your partner's scent is a huge factor in your attraction. You have an unconscious sniffer, 
you are not even aware of that helps you choose your mate. So typically we are attracted to a particular kind of smell too. The smell of a person who has a different MHC from ours or major histocompatibility complex is a set of genes that play a fundamental role in your immune system. Family members share similar genes and they're often similar immune systems. So the idea we are unconsciously seeking out a mate with a different MHC suggests that in part, scent cues evolved to protect close family members from procreating with each other. Research has demonstrated too that pregnant women are actually drawn to the scent of people with a similar chemical makeup during this crucial time, which indicates their brains are prioritizing the safety of a familiar tribe over sexual needs. And three, of course, poets and painters have been praising merely a dry biological or chemical response for thousands of years. Truly, there's a sacredness and intangible beauty about the way two people are drawn to each other. You feel it, a shiver of energy, an immediate recognition a magnetic pole, and an electric excitement, and the novelty and discovery of this other being. It's completely spiritual, a quantum experience, according to Laura Berman in her book, Quantum Love, which I totally recommend. So what's happening on the quantum level when we're talking about quantum physics and love? Well, one thing we know about is quantum entanglement. Two Quantum particles can become entangled by being together and then when shot out at large distances will interact and do things that make them entangled. If you destroy one, the other one goes away as if they're coherent right next to each other. And so what happens is we meet people in our lives and we our energies become entangled just like a quantum object does. And we may not even know. We have boyfriends or girlfriends in our past that we are linked to and we don't even know. There's a sharing of energies that occurs. These energy links are part of what's happening on a quantum level. Also, our habits and our programs are what's happening. We end up moving into these programs and they they simply, by creating coherence, the program begins to observe itself. The really amazing thing about interactions with people with whom we share a vibrational frequency is that when our energies come together, they actually combine to create their own energy field or relationship field. This new relationship field comes with its shared purpose and its own voice. And we start talking about the relationship field and the combining energies that occur in the early moments of attraction. That's when things start to get really interesting. Neil Donald Walsh describes this moment perfectly in his book, Conversations with God. He sets the scene. Two people, Tom and Mary, are on opposite sides of a room. They each radiate their personal energy. Their energies meet midway between them and unite to create a new energy unit. Walsh calls Tom Mary. As they both feed energy to Tom Mary, energy is sent back to each of them through the quantum field. And the closer they draw to each other, the shorter and more intense the cord of energy becomes. With each step in the other's direction, that intensity vibrates and burns wider and brighter and deeper the intensity of their shared energy field. Their relationship field will continually be amplified by the individual vibrations, which are clearly a frequency match. And so you're finding somebody that goes beyond just their looks or whatever that you've created. And there's a resonance. So take responsibility for your own energy and what energy you're putting out because the energy you put out is what you will attract back to you. And don't let fear or grief destroy you. If you're afraid of men or women or you have fears about getting into a relationship, don't let those fears destroy you because it's your responsibility. If you don't want to be alone, then you don't have to. There's nothing wrong with being alone because one of the greatest joys in the world is to be single. And if you're single now and you didn't want to be, enjoy it. It's a wonderful, wonderful, joyous thing. I'm not talking about too much about sex. There's a lot of books that we can talk about, but we have to agree that sex is a powerful thing when it comes to creation. Sexual energy is the energy of creation. And as Napoleon Hill talks about, sexual transmutation is responsible for people becoming rich. And I believe what he's saying is he's, you're transmuting the energy from sexual to higher states. He makes the argument that people when they turn 41 are more likely to be rich because their energy level, they were able to move beyond that sexual energy that doesn't want to go away. So he's literally talking about chakras here. But the idea is that if you can avoid letting go of your sexual energy and not using it in a certain way, you can channel that energy. So there is a power in not having sex or having that energy. 
What are the reasons that we have sex? Researchers Cindy Meston and David Buss asked 203 men and 241 women to list the primary reasons why they had sex. They then uncom- they compiled a list of 237 response reasons and presented it ask to another group, asking them to rank how often those reasons had motivated their own sex lives. What resulted was a ranked list of the main reasons why people had sex. Number one, I've listed some of the other so I've listed some of the other common reasons in, in this table and I'll talk about it in, in a second. But the idea is through me, to me, by me, it's always about whether or not it's an interaction with us or someone else. There's many different motivations. We have motivations of our own selves to we have motivations of the hunt. We have motivations of power. One of my girlfriends in the past, when I asked her what she thought love was, she says, it's power. Why do we fall in love? To feel that bond, to understand that feeling of that moment. Some, some liked, I wanted to express my love for the person. That was a reason. Others calibrate, I wanted to harm another person and they'll have sex out of anger. It was out of duty because they felt guilty if they didn't. Some said sex is an amazing way to connect with my partner. All the way to I'm not worthy of the love I desire. I believe that you can have a glimpse of enlightenment no matter what your frequency is when you start out having sex. I view orgasm as a shortcut to this feeling state of bliss. A high level of energy. It's a huge spike in the rush of the energy as you climax giving you a glimpse of the full blown through you of all of eternity. But whether you stay there or go back to the lower frequency state in large part, it can be a quick blip like a spike on a heart monitor, or you can reset the bar and you help you maintain or set a new bar for your coherent state of being. And the bliss found with orgasm moves even higher when it comes to a state of true love. The co- most common limiting beliefs that I come across when I try to help people in this regard is that I'll never find real love. That's a belief that a lot of people even don't know they have. So this abusive or untrustworthy behavior is just how men are. Like somebody is being abusive or unavailable or untrustworthy. They're just terrible. They'll tell you a story about this, what this man does and how terrible he is. And then they create the belief that this behavior is just how men are. Or a woman does something terrible and they just think that's how women are because that's what I had in the past. I'm telling you personally from somebody that has walked in on two of his girlfriends having sex with somebody else. There was a time when I was afraid to find love because I had been betrayed in those ways. But once I took responsibility for it and it was my own fault because I had not loved in the proper ways, I was able to let that go. But sometimes we can't. So a lot of people have this belief as soon as they let down their defenses that they'll get hurt and that love can never feel good. And that is not a true belief. The other shoe is going to eventually drop or all men will leave or all women leave or all men cheat or all women cheat or women or men don't really want a nice guy. They always want a bad boy. All the good ones are taken. I've heard that belief. You may have even said it. I'll just lose my power if I give in to love or I'm not, I'm just not good at being vulnerable or love never lasts. My guess is that you relate to several of these beliefs on this list, and you could probably add a few others. But these beliefs didn't appear out of thin air. Where do your beliefs come from? Find out where they are and change the story of why the beliefs came from and your belief may change. I'm not talking about religious beliefs or your personal opinions, but experiences that you had. We have incidents that happen to us. And we don't make a big deal about it. Somebody says something terrible about us or destroys our own self-confidence. And we can literally make that one incident where something happened, destroy our whole lives and make it take away our ability to love. Finding true love is not obtaining a particular object or an achievement. I'm telling you, there's one way that one another exercise, start looking for the beauty in everything. Something that I have found very effective. If you're looking for love, 
Start looking for the beauty in everything. When you're walking down the street, every single flower and bug and plant, make them beautiful. And go through a program in your mind where you make them beautiful and, and observe their beauty. And it gives you this kind of loving kindness. And it's a practice of altruistic love and it connects you to love. Something that Buddhist meditators often do. It is the commitment to counteracting negative experiences with a loving perspective. I believe that this this connects to generosity of true love as you choose to believe the best of your partner and see even difficult experiences as a gift. They're beautiful. Loving kindness meditation is another good one. I'll be creating several meditations soon related to this particular episode to help you find your soulmate, to let go of a past relationship and to find that loving kindness. But you must find a way to practice four types of love with four kinds of people. A respected beloved, a dearly beloved, a neutral person, and a hostile person. You must find a way to love all of those kind of people. Place focus on yourself and mentally dissolve the barriers between yourself and the other people that you're thinking about. In your own mind, find love for them. Find people in your life and create love for them no matter what. Recognize the truth that we are all one and that we, we love all. Because when you find that, you, it, it unlocks this ability to love that is, is truly wonderful. Meditation is a wonderful way to train your brain to see your partner through the lens of true love. As your loving perception informs your relationships, relationships reality, so too will your energy state create even more opportunities to strengthen and solidify that reality. Guided meditation have proven to be extremely powerful arbiters of change in your mental and physical state. I know we've talked about visualization. I'll be doing a podcast about that, about visualization. You can use it in training your body. You can use it in so many different ways. It's widely used in the sports world. Basketball players envision their free throws going in the basket. Swimmers envision their bodies executing the perfect butterfly stroke. And Olympic skiers practice how they'll move down the course. That visualization is powerful and has differentiated the champions. It is so effective because your brain can't tell the difference sometimes between something you're actually experiencing and something you're imagining if you're doing it properly. Because your brain thinks you're actually experiencing the goal of your meditation. It initiates a physiological response to what it believes is happening to you. So choose to believe the best in your partner. Choose to believe the best. Meditation can activate your muscles, raise and lower your body temperature, even change your cells when it comes to love. So I recommend if you want to find love to meditate. It gives the the brain what it thinks is real life experience. And by changing the perception of an experience, by visualizing that you're in love, it helps the brain accept that neural pathway once you find love. In the movie, Conversations with God, the character Neil says to God, I I just want my life back. And God responds, you can't have anything that you want. They then have an entire dialogue while God explains to Neil that by wanting something, all you get is the experience and the feeling of wanting. Now don't get me wrong, I know you want to meet your soulmate. That's a given. In fact, the wanting you feel is a powerful force that sets the process of manifestation into motion. But if what God said to Neil is true, that wanting only produces more wanting, then once we've identified what it is we want, we must learn how to shift our state from wanting to having. It's the simplest terms. This is the process of living as if. Living as if means stepping outside of your current reality and stepping into the reality you wish to be true. It's when your daily actions reflect and are congruent with your belief that your soulmate exists and is already yours. The best example of this principle I've ever heard was was told to me once by this woman. I believe she was a writer, and she she became who's I I, I can't quite I think she, I can't quite remember her name, but she, she became clear when she was ready to share her life with someone. She began living as if that person were already a part of her life. 
and she would play music she imagined he would enjoy. She wore pretty nightgowns to bed instead of her typical t-shirt and sweats. And every morning, she would feel that they were waking up and starting their day together. And every night at dinner, she would light candles and set a place for him at the table. Now, according to this writer, the guy eventually arrived. She sent a clear message to the universe and the universe delivered. Or she moved herself towards that reality. And it was already there and it just integrated itself into her life. And I can tell you that I did that. That's the way that I imagined it. Going through, setting out a dinner ta- table, it was, it, it's, it's an easy shift. Because you, if you're living alone, you get used to a certain habit. And then you're like, kind of, there's a party that might be like, I don't know if I want to have a relationship because I really like being alone. So by forcing yourself to live with as if, it starts to change things. For example, buy two tickets to a concert or play that's several months in a way. Holding the intention that you'll attend it with whoever it is. Maybe it can be a random person. It's interesting when you do that. You find that you'll find somebody that wants to go with you. Or the next time you're shopping for greeting cards, pick up a couple that would be fitting to give to your beloved on a birthday or celebrate your anniversary, knowing that sometime soon that they will be here and are there things for your home you're waiting to buy. If you knew with absolute certainty, whoever it is that's going to be in life would be walking through your front door with a mat with a matter of moments or weeks or months. Have you prepared your home? Is there a part of you that doesn't want them to come into your home because it's not ready yet? So you, you, you would get new sheets and towels or dishes. You'd clean your bathroom and plant the garden. And you, you know, believe that you have so many on the way and creating the space for the person in all areas of your life becomes a priority. And it's also a part of loving yourself. Each of us has a unique set of preferences and standards, and what is completely acceptable one person could be a deal breaker for another. A certain degree of compromise is to be expected in every relationship. And I'm certainly not suggesting that you or your soulmate will live happily ever after without having to make a single adjustment. Compromising and accommodating to one's person's needs are, are part of growth, both as a couple and as individuals. However, if you find that being a particular person means having to compromise one or more of your core values, I would suggest that he or she is probably not the person for you. If you know you absolutely want children and you meet somebody who absolutely does not, that's, that's a deal breaker. Make your soulmate list. That's what you need to do. It's a great way to clarify what are your values and, the, and, and a clear idea of what you want before you meet your soulmate. The clearer and more clarified you are, the easier it will be to recognize them because you'll have the picture starting to draw. I believe in this particular case, it is in the details and there is no detail that's not too important. Once you're very clear about the characteristics you're willing to compromise on and which you are not, you are ready to create your list. Begin by thinking about the aspects of your life that you look forward to sharing with a partner, the things you look forward to doing together, and the way you would like to feel in his or her presence. How would you, how would I like to feel when I wake up in the morning next to my soulmate? What kind of lifestyle will we lead? Are we both workaholics or couch potatoes? How will we spend our weekends? Are we going to hike local trails or go into the movies or cultural events or travel or hanging out around the house? Do we have or want children? Am I willing to accept someone else's children into my life? Telling the universe the characteristics you're looking for in a soulmate is similar to typing a keyword into an internet search engine. The more specific you are, the greater the chances your search will yield exactly what you are looking for. You're playing a very specific order. You're placing it with the universe. You're moving to a very specific universe. So as you're writing your list, make sure it includes two important criteria that a lot of times you'll forget. Make sure your soulmate is single. And whatever it is that you want them to be, if it's straight or gay, you have to be specific about that. You may find your soulmate and they don't love you because they're gay or whatever it is, or straight. And then make sure that they're available for healthy, loving, committed, long-term relationship or marriage, if that's what you want. My soulmate is someone who lives within so many miles away from me and is willing to move here. Love is a triumph of imagination over intelligence, according to H.L. Mencken. So create your soulmate list. There's a handful of qualities and traits. There's, and it's good to look up different ideas and look up different words and synonyms as descriptors. Are they abundant, adorable, affectionate, ambitious, articulate, 
beautiful, bubbly, caring, charismatic, creative, considerate, emotionally available, endearing, funny, generous, great relationships, healthy and independent. They cook, they play golf, they bungee jump, whatever makes you excited. They they loving they love nurturing playful sex sen- sensuous smart spiritually open or they attend church or temple or mosque they're successful or supportive of your career dreams or whatever it is that you do they're intelligent they're honest they're loving they're emotionally healthy they're fun they're sweet they're attractive they're secure they provide safety so you create affirmations and you can make them specific about the type of man that you're with or a woman or whatever it is that you want to create. The more specific, how could the the universe resist to give this to you? The better it is, the more specific, the universe is racing to find that exact order. One of the characters on The Secret, John Asara, he says that he met his wife that way. One of the greatest things that you need to learn before you fall in love and while you're in love is the power of forgiveness. You may not have forgiven yourself for things which may not allow you to give it into the relationship that you want. At the same time, things will come up in a relationship and you have to learn the ability to forgive. I've discovered some of the many ways soulmates find each other. When you hear stories, it's pretty empowering to realize that even the most mystical, magical encounters require the soon-to-be lovers to take action to deliberately put themselves in the right place and at the right time. They set an intention. They follow it with an action. They make a list of desired qualities. They set the intention. They find the perfect life partner. It's that simple. But you have to be on the lookout for clues and prepare yourself mentally and emotionally, physically when fate calls upon you. A lot of times I've seen people are reunited with childhood or high school sweethearts. How many times have you had the thought, I wonder what happened to so-and-so? Many people find their true love by attending a reunion as a result of hearing about a long-lost friend and then making the first move to reconnect. I've seen people meet their soulmates in that, in that way, even personally. People that I've loved have found better loves with their with their childhood sweethearts. And that's all good because love is wonderful. Some people, myself included, have had dreams or premonitions that provided clues about how or where or when to find their soulmate. And they acted upon these clues. One morning five years ago, Englishman David Brown woke up with a cell phone number running through his mind. Brown had no idea where the number came from, but he sent a text message to it anyway, hoping to solve the mystery. He reached Michelle Kitson, who lived 60 miles away. She had no explanation as to why her number would be running through his head, but after several messages back and forth, they ended up meeting and falling in love. David and Michelle were recently married and have just returned from their honeymoon in India. True stories like that are clear reminder to listen to our dreams, trust our intuition, and have faith that the universe is even now sending us signs that will lead to our love. My great hope is that you find your true love. Many of the people that found their soulmates had a gut feeling. They should go to a specific place or made the choice to honor their intuition, even if they had other plans. One woman who was especially, who actually feeling is quite depressed, had an impulse to go to an aquarium, someplace she'd never been before and had no real desire to visit. But when she went there, she met the dolphin trainer with whom she fell in love. And they're now happily married and living in Hawaii. Another woman received a last minute invitation to a party. She really didn't feel like socializing that night, but something inside her urged her to go. She met her husband at that party. More than a few were fixed up on blind dates by friends. And while they had never thought of themselves as the blind date type, they followed through on ways to discover that Cupid had struck. Another common thing and I've noticed is that soulmates that people that find their soulmates, they take action. They join an online dating service and met their beloveds. I, I have more than one friend who met their, that who met their soulmate or, or their, their true love on an online dating service, and it's okay. In fact, an estimated 80% of the population will have an online virtual identity by the year 2011. And just in case you think that uh, there's a lack of internet savvy will prevent you from taking advantage of the latest social networking technology, think again. I've heard of 80-year-old women just taking action with a little help from one or two people and making computer literate friends and finding their true love on Match.com. And number six, many soulmates 
are met because they take a bold step to take a make adventure. So you may go out and want to look at the whales for some reason and you meet, you meet your true love. Sometimes the act of taking a bold step or following your heart's desire actually leads you to the doorstep of your beloved for in many different ways. We can see that. You know, Gandhi once said, we must become the change we wish to see in the world. And as you prepare to manifest your soulmate, you can apply the timeless wisdom to your own life by becoming the lover, the friend, the playmate, the partner and soulmate that you've been looking for. Become the person that you want to be loved. And it's a reflection on a mirror in front of you. It's amazing what you can do. So, who do you want to manifest to love? You don't need to have a specific face. Give the universe an open invitation to find your perfect soulmate and trust in the universe. And find that person you're attracted to who offers you the greatest possibility for growth for both human beings to evolve in their greatest expression. Find the one that fits the key into the lock. Understand that love can be a form of addiction and that you need to control it and understand it. Don't let it overcome you and destroy your life. That's what I've found so far about creating relationships and people are doing it all the time. People are finding love all the time. And this is so complicated and there's so much more to it and there's so many different dating services that this subject could, could be talked about for thousands of pages and hundreds of hours. But that's just a basic idea of some ways that you can use the way your brain works and the way that you create re reality to really have a powerful effect to find the love of your life or to improve the relationship that you're in. And I hope in some way that this, this podcast helps you to find the love of your life or to make your relationship so much better because you deserve that because you have power over your reality. It's been a real joy that you joined me. I'm so grateful that you listen to this podcast and I hope you find that love out there that's meant for you. And if you're in love, I bless you and I hope that it magnifies and gets better every day. And thank you so much for joining the Reality Revolution.